let me start off initially with some broad questions with regards to um, where are we now, you know, where are we going. But this where are we now, I, I, I'd like to share this one particular slide um, that point to the possibilities of what is, uh, what is coming. This is the age wave in Japan right now from 1930 to 2050. Uh, not, not too far down the road, actually. And what you see here is a, what is normally known as a population pyramid. And the pyramid is usually a triangle. And the bottom are the young people. One side is the males, one side the females. And each line uh, on that, uh, uh, in this particular graph represents an age cohort. And over time, what you see is a triangle becoming a rectangle, becoming an inverted triangle. And <clears throat> the population in Japan, I think, represents the canary in the cave or in the mine. Uh, the, uh, the situation of uh, the, the rapid aging of the society and the implications that it holds uh, for the rest of us. And uh, there's great concerns right now in Japan because the population uh, was hovering around 127 million people, which is about half the population of the U.S., squeezed in an area the size of California. Uh, but uh, in the next, let's say, 50, uh, 60, 70 years, they're anticipating that um, they're in this path towards population decline. Uh, they've already reached the pinnacle and the population is beginning the process of dropping. And it could drop down from 127 million down to as low as 40 million, depending upon what prediction you, know, you look at. But it is so significant, we know that those that will remain will be older adults. Um, and there's just going to be a shortage of workers that's going to be able to carry the dependent young and the dependent old. Potential for Societal collapse is also there, okay? So the, this is a, a significant type of an issue. And this is uh, something that even Korea is beginning to address because Korea is also in this path towards population decline, okay? So this is not uh, something that is small. It, it, it has uh, uh, massive implications. Uh, the um, U United Nations, for example, had pointed out that uh, the, year, uh, the, the, the 21st century will be um, faced with three major issues, challenges, one having to do with terrorism, right, security issues, uh, one having to do with resources, which is uh, energy issues, and the third, aging, uh, because aging has the potential for having some implications in terms of just population growth, economic development, all sorts of other uh, combination of um, uh, 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 things that we need to attend to. So this is, this is what is happening in Japan right now. When we look at, um, you know, here I have some, you know, some cartoons that I want to share, and some of which may be somewhat dated. But here, you know, we've got this pattern with regards to our hospitals um, that for quite some time now, um, you know, during the heyday when Medicare was fairly uh, well off, um, we've, we had uh, people staying in hospitals uh, considerably longer right now. So the, 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 the tendency right now is for, for quicker discharges um, and quicker and oftentimes sicker discharges. And so we've seen this explosion in home health care, for example, as, uh, as a result. So this, this uh, one cartoon, you have this patient here that is obviously um, in some pain. Physician tells uh, the patient your blood pressure and temperature are way up, but your Medicare coverage is way down. Looks like you can go home today, Mrs. Finch, okay? Um, you look at our bed supply right now, <clears throat> um, which is the red line. It has essentially remained, uh, this is our nursing home bed supply, and we're looking just at nursing home beds. We're not looking at adult residential care homes, the rack homes, the adult, adult foster homes right now that has sort of picked up some of that slack. But, if you just look at the nursing home bed supply from this period, 1981 now to 2010, um, we're finding that the bed supply of nursing homes have remained essentially flat. Population, of course, continues to grow at a nice clip. Right now, there's only about three or four other states in the union 
that have growth rates in terms of elder uh, population growth rates faster than, the, than Hawaii. So our growth rate of elders are growing like this, and our, bob, uh, our nursing home bed supply is like this. So this becomes an issue that um, may result in you know, so some other kinds of implications down the road. Likewise, so here um, I make reference to the percent change in older, uh, the oldest old in four fastest growing states. Um, that is only looking at the uh, oldest old, uh, and we're we're uh, we're we're number four, okay? Um, and this is the median in terms of uh, in terms of uh, the population of the U.S. as a whole. So this 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 is quite significant in terms of fact, the fact that if you take 50 states, we're in the top top four. You know that that's that's pretty. Uh, pretty uh, significant. Now, some of these numbers are 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 off. Uh, for example, emergency services uh, probably is way in excess of a thousand dollars a visit right now. Um, I had taken um, the hospital care visits probably uh, is uh, is closer to about forty three hundred dollars per day right now. Uh, this is if you pay cash. Uh, okay, obviously we got uh, insurances that cover. I. I after I had sent this, I had my, uh, my uh, student assistant do some uh, updating, and I forgot to send you the, the, the change. But the, the point of all of this is that we've got costs that um, will continue to creep upwards. It will not creep downwards, right? Uh, the nursing home bed supply, uh, the nursing home SNF beds probably is uh, in excess of $350 a day. Uh, uh, ICF is probably... Um, maybe slightly higher than $250 a day. So, you know, if we start looking at these numbers all the way down, um, you know, factor in another 20, 30%, and we would probably have something that is closer. The point that, of all this, of course, is that it's, it's, it's getting pretty high, okay? Same thing with uh, this, uh, the figures with regards to long-term care funding. Um, these, are, these are dated here. But we know that Medicare is the primary payer, not of long-term care, but of acute care for elders. Um, for home health care and for, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 just a, a small portion of long-term care, you know, for skilled nursing for a short period of time. And even for that, it's only a, proportion, a portion of that. Medicaid, uh, which is health insurance for the poor, uh, pays for the lion's share. This $800 million is off. Right now, probably it's in excess of uh, $1.3, $1.4 billion right now as far as a total Medicaid budget is concerned. Um, I think of that, uh, and then the number of lives, I think we're closer to about 250, 260,000 lives that Medicaid presently covers. We're talking everybody, from the young to the old. Um, just a couple of years ago, uh, the figure that uh, I was shared by uh, Medicaid was that we were at about 40,000 lives that both Ohana and Evercare were, were covering, and you know, they were somewhat split between the two. So, um, but those 40,000 lives out of the 280,000, um, uh, probably it, it's, it's like 20% that is eating up about 80% of the cost, okay? Um, and th th this, these are um, figures that we need to uh, revisit, but the, 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 the message is you know, still the same, that most of the monies to pay for long-term care, which you obviously are aware of, is, is coming from Medicaid and it's, it's, um, it's continuing to grow and it's, it's scaring everyone. We, we don't have a full control over uh, how we're going to essentially manage that particular cost uh, that we, uh, which continues to grow. And the aging network, the Kupuna Care, which comes out of the county office on aging, the state office on aging, uh, represents us just a small sliver. Uh, I had about 13,000. I think I think it's closer to 15 million right now. Okay, but it's it's um, it's it's a limited amount of money. People cannot uh, receive this service on a continuous basis uh, for uh, uh, an extended period of time. So it. It, and, and, and there's needs for it to be better coordinated with Medicaid, but it, it represents another source of, uh, of uh, funding to support our, our, our senior population. Of course, we've got the private pay market, long-term care insurance, uh, cash from reverse mortgage that is coming to, into play. Um, but even with reverse mortgage, 
probably at most maybe about um, uh, well, it's hard to say right offhand what what uh, what the numbers are. L long term care insurance probably maybe ten, no more than fifteen percent of the total population is is um, is utilizing this particular type of uh, payment system, and and. Uh, for some reason, uh, we, we, we can't seem to get the numbers higher than that. I mean, if we had more people on long-term care insurance, perhaps we can moderate uh, some of the, the drain from Medicaid, but um, that, that seems, seems not to be happening right now. Okay, so these are just the funding sources. We know um, um, we got, th these are variations in terms of uh, nursing home bed needs, uh, 2005 to 2000. Um, 30 uh, for the various islands, most of which um, the demand, of course, will be on Oahu. Um, and let me, let me point out um, a couple of issues here that I, I sort of wanted to share with you. And, and you know, we, we can have some discussions with regards to this. But one of the first things that I, I, I think that we need some assistance with is trying to get um, a bearing with regards to what is in fact going on. Um, how well are we doing in terms of the delivery of our services? And, and what I am pointing out here is that we don't have a good dashboard, a dashboard um, of long-term care indicators. You know, uh, for example, when we talk about um, the human body, if you have EMS workers uh, trying to assist uh, somebody uh, on the freeway that has gotten um, hit by another car or suffering uh, maybe a cardiac arrest, uh, they call in uh, the information to the hospital and they provide probably just about, you know, just a few bits of information of which are the, ba uh, the, the vital signs, right? The heart rate, temperature, uh, the pulse, and so on. So, just a f with a few vital signs, just maybe five or six indicators, physicians can kind of tell how well the body is doing, right? Likewise, when we start talking about uh, the economy of a general area, uh, Honolulu or maybe Maui County, if we had about 15 indicators, economic and leading economic indicators, we can kind of pretty much tell how well that particular geographic area is doing. We don't have something comparable as far as long-term care is concerned. And the idea is, would it be possible for us to have a set of indicators that can kind of provide us with a, a clue as far as how well we're doing, um, not just as a state, but at the county level, county level because that's the, that's the, um, the geographic extent to which we have the delivery system working. Um, so, um, um, part of the indicators might include some information about population growth of seniors, for example. Uh, it might have something to do with the number of nursing home beds that's available. It might even have, uh, have to have some information about elder abuse and neglect, because if abuse and neglect start, be, start climbing, perhaps that's an indication that we're short on other services, then, you know, and, and it's kind of uh, in, intertwined. So, one of the things that um, uh, I had done and was working on some time ago was uh, I, I worked with uh, UH uh, Center of the Family. This is with a, they have an aging data center. And we tried the process of identifying uh, indicators that was publicly available. Uh, so th this is not proprietary information, but publicly available and available at the county level uh, so that we could uh, see whether or not um, uh, the, the aging data center could capture this information on a regular basis, at least on a quarterly basis, for example, to see whether or not there's changes over time. And they've done that, okay? And we're the only state in the union that has actually created something like this. But what they haven't still done, uh, worked on, is uh, to get some community input with regards to the goals for our long-term care delivery. And I'll talk about what some of these goals could be. Um, but there, there's, because there's so much information um, to determine what it is that we need to collect or want to collect, um, it has to be tied back to what, what it is that we want to achieve for Hawaii. 
you know. So, so that discussion has to occur, and I'll, 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 I'll make reference to that shortly, okay. So, so with that, right now, the aging data center, the center of the family has about 130 indicators. Well, that's too many. That's too many. We've got to somehow reduce that to something that's a little bit more manageable. So the reduction of the aging data center to a smaller subset is a task that has not yet occurred. Okay? And then there's a need for periodic reporting and analysis of the finding, uh, findings and the maintenance of this system. Uh, the, the, uh, this whole process with the uh, center and the family began uh, years ago. Um, with funding from the uh, State Executive Office on Aging, and that has, I think, stopped, and so the maintenance of this whole effort um, is in question right now. But, but this kind of a dashboard can provide us with some clues as to whether or not we're doing okay or we're not doing okay, or certain areas perhaps is, is managing our long-term care population better than other areas. We need a dashboard is, is a point uh, of all this. So, um, another question that we need to ask is not only where are we, but uh, where are we going and who's leading the way? Um, this might get a little bit more controversial here, but <clears throat> what I see over time, um, and this has been decades now in, in the process, is this devolution of responsibility um, in terms of monies that um, um, were at the federal level and that was providing services for uh, elder care, long-term care, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, Older Americans Act, and we've seen some, some reductions and, 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 and probably more um, are, are anticipated down the road. And then what, what we see is um, this relegation of this responsibility to the state, from the state to the county, county to the uh, family caregivers and family caregivers to the older adults themselves. And, and, and many of these uh, initiatives that have emerged along the way are kind of just symptomatic or reflective of this kind of change that I'm talking about. Okay, so this devolution of responsibility is a long-term trend that we've been experiencing for a couple of decades now and probably this whole process might quicken a bit more. Lack of clear direction. Um, um, I'm not quite sure, and, and this is something that we may have some, um, you know, questions about or disagreements about, but there, there, there needs to be a better, um, I guess, way in which we can propose some directions with regards to how are we going to address this long-term care needs in Hawaii. And I, I just see uh, a lot of... Um, um, competing interest groups and, uh, and sometimes things that uh, occur make sense and other times it's sort of short term and, 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 and with little follow through. But anyway, th this is just a, a way of pointing out that we've got issues there. <clears throat> this lack of clear directions um, is a tool, points to the lack of a tool for decision making, right? And, and here I'm suggesting that some, a need for some kind of a long-term care commission. And, and we've, we've created a long-term care commission, uh, but it was for a specific purpose a couple years ago, and that work has been completed, and they've walked away. I don't think we can afford to do that. This thing is forever, right? Um, so maybe we need to revisit this whole idea of a commission and rethink the need for the kinds of things that we need this particular body to be charged with as far as uh, resolving the kind of competing uh, demands, uh, different, uh, different uh, uh, policy directions that come out from the trade associations, from Medicaid versus Medicare, uh, or, or, or for, uh, from the health department versus the Department of Human Services, versus SHIPTA or the Office on, uh, Executive Office on Aging and so on. And everybody has a legitimate point and, 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 and perspective, but there's always trade-offs, obviously. And th there's a need to begin considering the value of having a body to help identify problems, prioritize needs, um, um, set goals, mission statement, 
and I have the authority to perhaps make some, uh, uh, set, some set, set some directions in this area. And this you know, calls for represented, representation from various uh, appointed stakeholders. Uh, and there's a whole process of negotiation and compromise among competing perspectives. Uh, the need to propose legislation perhaps may come out of this because what happens oftentimes is we go to the legislature, uh, one group has a wonderful idea, and if another group with a competing perspective does not like it, either they will testify against it or they will do it uh, in the back room and nothing happens. So we've got to be able to, ha and, and what happens if there is disagreement is that the legislators, the decision makers will tell everyone, you guys have to come back next year after you guys have come up with something that makes sense and collectively. So, you know, let's, let's not waste the, that kind of time. Let's, let's, let, let, you know, we should recognize the fact that this, this is going to be um, uh, a decision or, or it has to involve the experts that are in the, in the field and that uh, perhaps also the, uh, the, uh, the consumers that are affected by, by, the, by these decisions and, and, and use that, uh, that year before, before session to work out the compromise, get maybe 80% you know, consensus so that we can move forward. Um, we had a long-term care commission. It's been premature, you know, it's prematurely time, time limited. And I think that the, 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 the responsibilities of it was perhaps uh, too, too limited in, in terms of the, what, what, what we needed for it to do. Because to have these kinds of decisions made by the legislature during the 60-day 60, 60 period is, is probably not uh, the best way to, to, to make decisions in this particular area. Okay. How do we get there? Uh, how do we map, you know, some of the, what are some of the trade-offs, you know, with regards to this whole, whole, whole issue? Um, <clears throat> this is where, when I was talking about um, this indicator issue, one of the, after we come up with all of these indicators, we have to then decide what indicators are we going to select. Well, part of the, the and, and, and that calls for the community to participate in some, some dialogue with regards to what is it that we're trying to achieve, okay, in this whole area. And I'm, 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 what I have here is just some suggestions, possibilities as far as what we can achieve as far as long-term care. And these are competing goals now. So one might be self-responsibility. That, that is, we want to emphasize that everybody should emphasize, we should emphasize healthy aging, successful aging, productive aging. We should, we should in, a, in a sense, this is a kind of a self-responsibility type of a push, right? The second might be, we want to increase system efficiency. Uh, so we want to develop um, an adequate, not, a, not a, a Cadillac model, but you know, within a for, an affordable range, but an adequate long-term care delivery system, okay? So there might be some need to discuss what that calls for. Another one might be, let's look at the fact that so much of, of our Medicaid dollars go towards nursing homes, and we need to consider an emphasis uh, on non-institutional services. And this discussion has already occurred. So um, some states have been talking about reshifting the money from nursing homes to home and community base. So this, this kind of a goal is a rebalancing of the long-term care system. So that's another kind of a goal. It's somewhat different from the others. Uh, another one might be uh, we need to have more intergenerational community integration, a family or elder-friendly community approach, a livable community. Um, ARP is beginning to talk about this. Kirk Caldwell, the, our mayor, has had a, a state of the city uh, message, and he talked about uh, and, uh, making Hawaii an elder-friendly community. Okay, and it's a WHO type of a designation, so it, it may be a big thing. But essentially, this is a, a different vision. Okay, and the last is, you know, we don't have much money. Let's just sort of just cut to the chase and help only the very needy and everyone else has to fend for themselves. So that's another approach. But we have to have a, com a community dialogue because depending upon which direction we select, uh, the kinds of information we collect for this minimum data set that we, we would want to sort of track over time would, would differ, okay? We haven't had that kind of a dialogue. Now all of this, 
is tied to this question with regards to money, right? Money. Um, uh, how are we going to be able to pay for all of this service, this, uh, the, the, cost of, the, the government costs of long-term care? And, and here, these are just examples, and some of which we've already tried and we're continuing to use. And some, some of the approaches that government, state and county government have, have been using, and, and federal government have been using, in terms of controlling the cost of long-term care is on the supply side. Let's reduce the number of nursing home beds, for example. Okay? Let's reduce the number of nursing home beds. Um, when, when I was um, involved with uh, Schick, uh, at one long, t long time ago, um, um, and we were working on the uh, the, the, the plan, the ship to plan. Uh, we, uh, we, we, the uh, the the numbers uh, or, or the the ratio of nursing home beds in Hawaii relative to the national average was like about 20 beds per 1,000, and this, the national was at 54 beds per 1,000. And so we had this debate, and the the, the question was. Um, should we somehow control the number of nursing home beds in Hawaii? And, and well, so the, the, the plan called for limiting it to 30 beds per 1,000 elders, not going up to 54 beds per 1,000. And we thought that maybe if we uh, kept the pressure at 30, we were at 20, so it was still room for growth. Uh, we, uh, and the thought was that if we, we kept it at 30 rather than opening up the spigot and going up to 54, we could put some pressure and perhaps uh, moderate the cost of long-term care. So there was some logic involved when we, 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 we created the plan at that time. That didn't do anything though, okay? Um, because uh, there were other reasons why beds were not being built. The other uh, policy is to increase the number of home and community, uh, HCBS is home and community-based services. So if we spend more money in that direction, the idea is that maybe uh, less money would need to be spent uh, in, in, the, in the home setting. Uh, restrict services and health uh, care benefits, tighten eligibility. Right now, uh, I was talking to uh, uh, someone that, uh, as a profession, um, helps Medicaid applicants apply for Medicaid, and they said, Invariably, the first um, letter they get back from Medicaid is that your application has been denied. Guess what? Medicaid saves one month of payment just by the denial alone. They can't do this forever, but so tightening the eligibility or playing around with some of that kind of ruling has some impact in terms of saving some money. Uh, not, you know, not on the long haul, but, but to a certain extent. So you can alter reimbursement methods as well. These are all on the supply side. Then you get on the demand side, that is, if we have um, older adults assuming some personal responsibility for their health and finances, right? Um, perhaps we can, we can if, if everybody goes down to uh, the gym or exercise regularly, watch their cholesterol level, um, and I'll do everything um, um, uh, that we know of based upon public health the principles, uh, we can probably keep people uh, healthy uh, right up until their natural lifespan followed by immediate death. And that would be a goal that we, we would love to see achieved. But that would take personal responsibility, you know, uh, and, and, and a, lot of, a, lot of, uh, a lot of public, re uh, public uh, education. But anyway, so that, that would reduce demand for long-term care if, if that were to happen. Private long-term care financing, well, like I said, you know, long-term care insurance has gotten up to about, you know, 12, 15 percent max. But we, we haven't gotten too many more people charged up about, you know, buying long-term care insurance. But, and then the whole, that whole industry seems to have sort of taken a step back to a certain extent and they're reconsolidating. So it's, it's not going to be cheaper down the road. But anyway, um, if more people were to do this, then obviously they wouldn't um, latch on to Medicaid. Uh, increase copay, uh, empower clients and communities for self-help, information and resources. Can we, can we create communities that are in the business of, uh, let's say, natural, naturally occurring retirement communities, uh, geographic communities that are into people helping people? You know, it, it, it requires a lot of um, 
community work, okay? Uh, and, but but it's, it's, it, that, that's something that um, well, you know, we could consider. Increase awareness and choices, uh, advanced directives. Um, advanced directives obviously meaning that if we've got people at, uh, at, uh, that uh, are at the end stages of their, at, of their life, um, um, if, if people are, and, and this is something that Medicare has already, you know, um, required when people are admitted into hospitals. If people are, are, are not um, inclined to take heroic measures, right, uh, you know, uh, for fetal care, basically, just to get maybe a, an extra day or two days uh, at enormous cost, um, we, can, we, can, we can certainly save um, a lot of money as far as uh, government costs is concerned. So there, there are different approaches that can be taken. Some of them are already in practice, but much more that have to be done. Now, again, these are other things that we can consider. How do we, f if, if we have to find more money, because the numbers of older adults are gro is growing by leaps and bounds. Um, so even if we try to control costs, if the numbers increase, the cost is still going to increase, right? Unless we do some things even more drastic. But what, what can we do to find more resources? Or what can we do to reduce demand? So you've got things like taxes. We can increase taxes or have tax credits for behavior change, uh, private pay uh, for long-term care insurance. So, so this uh, obviously when people do this, then we, we, uh, we, we won't have to use uh, as much tax, tax monies. We can empower communities. We can create family support groups, uh, caregiver support groups volunteers, uh, pool existing funds, uh, we've got Medicare and Medica uh, we've got Medi uh, DHS and DOH, for example, um, pooling existing funds, you know, one, one, you know, maybe revolutionary <laughs> idea might be to, to see whether or not we can sort of consolidate both, both um, departments uh, and then possibly reduce our overall bureaucratic overhead, you know, um, a consol that's a consolidating bureaucracies. Um, uh, uh, one-stop shop having to do with this um, ADRC, the Aging and Disability Resource Center. Right now, older adults, if they want services or the children want to help them find services, you've got to go one place to med for Medicaid, another place for Meals on Wheels, another place to get your, your you know, assisted transportation from, you know, handy van. And it's, it's, it's a hassle and it's confusing and uh, it, it's, um, it wastes a lot of time. Um, and so having a one-stop shop might, might uh, work towards uh, increasing efficiency and reducing costs. Uh, reduce free services, ration, education training, promote consumer choice, control. So this, here I have a, um, in a sense, a goal, um, a proposed goal for elder care. Active life expectancy, not just increase longevity or not just life expectancy per se, but active life expectancy. Here, the, the assumption is that human lifespan has, you know, there's a natural, there, there's a natural um, lifespan when at, at some point we all die, right? And to a certain extent, you know, this, this number is, is creeping upwards, but basically, if uh, the, the bottom line there represents age from zero to 100, um, the vertical uh, axis is uh, level of dependency from, you know, independent on the top to dependent on the bottom. So at a very young age, a person is very dependent. And by 10, we say a person is pretty deep independent in terms of their ADL skills, you know, the ability to eat and bathe and dress and groom and feed and toilet themselves. So. Um, not in terms of going out and working, you know, making a living or anything like that, but remaining um, functionally independent. And they remain functionally independent for a relatively long period of time. Um, some people don't take care of themselves, and we, we see this slippery slope down here, right? And they have premature aging um, and maybe premature death. The dream is, can we keep the population productive and healthy right up until the natural lifespan is reached, followed by perhaps a heart attack and immediate death, okay? Um, rather than, 
you know, and, and that's a, <laughs> we don't want to kind of, you, you don't want to tell everybody that, people won't get it, you know, <laughs> but, but, the, the, but, the, but the, the point is that uh, we, if people can remain engaged, you know, and, and, um, and fit, you know, physically fit, socially fit, financially fit, you know, civically fit, um, up until the time they hit the natural lifespan and perhaps die um, fairly quickly and not need long-term caring, right? What we see at the federal and the state level is this kind of shift that is taking place. These are broad um, policy directions. They're shifting from institutional care to home and community-based care. That we know about, okay? There's also a shift towards what they call a more consumer-driven, or consumer-directed model. Um, that jury's still out on this, but the, the, there's been some efforts by Medicaid, for example, to work on some projects along this particular line. Um, one idea is, for example, you, get a, uh, you, you, uh, you allocate a certain amount of money for an individual that is on Medicaid, uh, and you say, uh, this is this is all that you have, and you know, the the point is for you to live in the community, and you make your choices uh, as far as how this money would be spent. And so, the the consumer then would make some selections as to maybe spending a little bit more on maybe personal care, or maybe a home care nurse coming in, and maybe a, a little uh, maybe a little bit, little bit less money on something else. But but that's a call that they would make personally, and maybe uh, they would uh, perhaps uh, make up the difference in other ways, perhaps. Okay, but the whole point is let's make this consumer-driven and directed. Aging in place in home-type settings. The idea, again, here is um, we've got multiple um, continuum, and this whole continuum from the home to an institutional setting. And as you become more disabled, uh, you take an individual and you move them to the next setting. You get more disabled, you move that person to an another setting. This aging in place in a home type setting suggests that let's keep people in a home type setting. And as they begin to become much more disabled, let's bring in services. If they become more disabled, bring in a little bit more. If they become more independent, take the services away, but keep that person there. Okay, that's, that's that model there. Uh, coordination between state and federal programs. So, <clears throat> so let's talk about some of the um, options uh, that, that are possible uh, or are being attempted having to do um, with um, s some of these uh, uh, changes that are taking place at the federal and state level. Okay. And so one having to do with what we call this aging in place strategy, um, which is an attempt to, uh, to a certain extent, limit resources. So here, you can take, um, you can take a, an area, uh, what we call a naturally occurring retirement community, uh, Palolo Valley, for example, or Nuwano, or Ma uh, Makiki, or Manoa, uh, which has a very, very large proportion of older adults living there. And the idea is, could we put at the community center where the park is, maybe a room or a section of uh, the community center uh, as maybe a place where um, some of the home care workers can, can use as a base, a staging area a staging area, and from, from there they can go out and fan out into the community. And the whole point is uh, they, their, their job then is to provide care to help the residents who are disabled and older uh, old in their communities to remain where they are. But having a staging area reduce the overall cost of, uh, of uh, keeping people in the community. And, and the Perhaps this office or the space, this physical space that we're talking about, perhaps might be a, uh, a county resource or a state resource, um, but it would be shared by maybe uh, some home care agencies, so maybe a durable medical product industries, maybe public health nursing, or so, but it would create an opportunity for various groups to coordinate with each other uh, in, in providing care. And the whole idea is to 
permit more people to age in place. You start with areas that ha are super high in, se in senior concentrations, yeah, and, and, and to keep them, keep them there. So maximize the ability to keep the population at home. So that's a strategy that uh, can be taken. Promote assisted living, and uh, this is something that uh, we were involved with uh, uh, years ago, and, and today, of course, we've got uh, over 10 or 15, I guess, assisted living facilities in the state, which is, which is a good thing. The other type of uh, <clears throat> facility that we need to look at are the low-income senior apartments because low-income senior apartments are much more numerous, and these are usually um, partially uh, subsidized with uh, uh, Section 8 HUD funding, okay? And, and, so, and so some of the people there just pay a third of whatever they collect, you know, from Social Security or um, uh, other sources, uh, SSI. And, and so, but these low-income senior apartments are basically that, they're apartments, so there is no support services there. There's no meals. There's nobody coming in to clean your place. But we have, we have thousands and thousands of older adults living in these places, and they're getting older every day, okay? So um, what we need to do is look at opportunities of perhaps having in these locations, and there's some of this that has taken place already, um, in these locations, uh, maybe a room where child and family services or Catholic Charities or another organization um, can use uh, to provide social services, for example, uh, to monitor the care of those that are in the building. Um, to what extent can we, in a sense, um, add some additional support services to support those that are using these places just as apartments, but we know over time we'll be becoming much more disabled and will be in need of some support services. If we can, in a sense, um, anticipate that, and that, that there's no reason, you know, I mean, it, it's sort of like a no-brainer. If we can begin the process of setting that up in all of the low-income senior apartments today, um, we have the opportunity of keeping people in these places rather than having them um, fall down, land up in the hospital, and then the, uh, and then the program basically then um, moves them over into an adult foster home, adult residential care home, or a nursing home at an enormous cost, basically cost that is borne basically by the state of Hawaii. So if we can, in a sense, um, anticipate that, and this is an aging in place strategy, keep people in their homes, but recognize some of the kinds of support services that they need. Bring in uh, meals, for example, have social workers come in, have somebody do maybe some, um, some um, health, uh, health assessments uh, on a periodic basis. That, that is uh, perhaps down the road uh, a cheaper strategy. Promote <clears throat> residential care home use. And this is something that has, has begun to um, take place over time. Uh, we have um, transformed the use of care homes. Um, uh, 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 you know, years ago, uh, you know, we've always had a shortage of nursing home beds, and then we've had so many people in hospitals that were waitlisted for nursing home beds. And then when we look at the level below that, the, the care homes, we found 20% vacancies all the time. Okay, so it again was a no-brainer to say, let's look at these care homes and these adult foster homes. What can we do to modify them or provide some additional training and make them capable of um, um, you know, uh, admitting uh, some of these more disabled individuals uh, and allow people to age in place? Okay, so, so this is something that has begun to take place and we, the numbers have been quite, uh, quite astonishingly large. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this is an example. If we start looking at, if we start looking at, at naturally occurring retirement communities, and we begin thinking in terms of uh, uh, where are these concentrations? Uh, they could be either geographic communities like Manoa or Nuano, Mauna Loa, or Palolo Valley, or wherever, or it could be a high rise. Okay. And, and we have like about 2,500 high-rises uh, and condominiums in Hawaii. 
And we did a study just looking at um, how many of them had a super high concentration of uh, older adults, 40% or more, and we found about 84 of them. So if we begin the process of identifying where these, uh, these high concentration areas is, are, we can then begin to uh, um, develop a strategy to say, you know, we don't have that much as far as resources, but let's begin concentrating in these areas first, you know, and see, see if we can begin the process of moving forward. The other strategy, uh, besides aging in place, is this whole managed care e effort, right, that is going on. Um, Medicaid has said, all right, we've been using this um, payment system that is based upon the HMO, you know, um, managed care. And the idea is we're going to have, we have 40,000 lives, elders that are on Medicaid, and the 40,000 people, we're going to say contract 20,000 to uh, Ohana Health Plan and the other 20,000 to United Healthcare or uh, Evercare. And, and for each of them, they're going to be uh, allocated on a per capita basis, and I, I'll give you maybe a hypothetical number, let's say 1,000 thousand dollars per patient per month okay and many of them might be still pretty able and so a thousand dollars may not necessarily be spent right but then on the other hand there's some of this twenty thousand that are in nursing homes and there they're using maybe close to ten thousand dollars a month so the whole um, gaming of this is to make certain that you try to get as many of them in the community so that your your company can make money okay or at least can break even right so that's managed care, and the whole idea is how do you use cheaper home care service in lieu of expensive institutional service. That's managed care, and that's what it's, it's all about. And, and with managed long-term care, you don't just use cheaper health care service, you use cheaper social services as well. Okay, so it's all that combination. Well, <clears throat> what we um, think is happening is that with health care costs has been rising, and so, and part of it has been linked up with fees for services. So, um, and with fee for services, uh, you know, if people uh, are sick, we, we provide more services, and we get, re uh, you know, uh, the provider gets reimbursed. Uh, they need more services. Uh, so, the more services uh, you can identify, or the more needs you can identify, more needs you can sort of uh, bill for, uh, you know, the provider can it essentially uh, uh, collect more money. Um, and hopefully it results in better care. But the, the, there, there comes a point where um, there's almost like dimin diminishing returns and that uh, it, it doesn't add that much more in terms of overall quality. With managed care, the idea is we, we have people that are not, let's say, well, and that if we were to, we, we, could, we can reduce the cost of care um, by uh, shifting some of the expense, you know, much more uh, strategically by using cheaper services or uh, using case management and, and uh, other techniques. And we can reduce our costs. And even if we reduce our costs, our quality can be improved, okay? Um, so there, there's possibilities. Uh, so with, with fee-for-service, if you're down here, you can see your quality, uh, quality of care improve up to a certain point and then it begins uh, declining. And with managed care, it's possible that um, you, can, you can improve the quality of care and reduce your cost, but at some point, it doesn't get any better. You know what I mean? And I think that with Ohana, Ohana and Evercare, I think that they're, they're beginning to see that um, they, they may have hit this point where there's not much more that they can figure out uh, in terms of really um, uh, reducing the uh, care. And, and, and I think that's part of the reason why I think Medicaid is sort of having them do even more, include even a bigger, uh, they're, they're, they're throwing in um, some of the young people in as well. But essentially, um, there, there, there comes a point with uh, the, the, this particular technique where um, the, the amount of improved savings um, reach a point of almost of diminishing returns. That, that's the point that I want to make. Okay. Okay. So, um, 
this is with regards to the Quest Managed Long-Term Care Initiative. So it began in around 2008. Um, it's uh, had some, you know, effect. In, they've been working on quality improvement, reducing costs, increasing access, and reducing fragmentation. Um, question as to whether or not we're going to actually reduce costs much more, um, and it's not having that much more of an effect. Maybe on a per capita basis, uh, it, 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 it's 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 optimal. But the numbers of people that are coming onto the role is increasing so fast that the the, the overall cost continues to climb. Yeah. Now, another option that can be considered is not just, you know, uh, managed care or aging in place, but increasing what we call home and community-based capacity, okay? And this calls for expanding um, um, public and private uh, sources, you know, with uh, uh, long-term care insurance, with waivers, and, so, uh, and there's other sorts of things that uh, has been going on to s sort of just increase uh, uh, home and community-based options. The last um, thing that I wanted to make reference to was uh, this whole area of workforce, because uh, that is one of the strategies has to include what are we going to do to find the workers. So part of the problem is monies. We, we got to have monies. Well, the money's going to pay for services, but the services is really delivered by people, and we need people. And, and so we have to crank out new workers all the time. We have to find more workers all the time. And workers don't come cheap, right? Um, uh, uh, RNs, for example, uh, you know, uh, will, will, um, will uh, be uh, a, a fairly large cost, and, and, and you know, hospitals are, are certainly cognizant of that and that's part of the reason why they've, they've taken various strategies to try to see whether or not they can utilize uh, less costly uh, uh, you know, nur nurses in, in lieu of RNs basically to control some of that cost. What we've been doing over at the college is looking at long-term care in terms of all of these basic services like eating and bathing and dressing and grooming and feeding and toileting and you know, getting people out of, in and out of bed. These are paraprofessional work. They're, they're not skilled work per se, but they're very important. So when we look at our delivery system uh, or in terms of our workers, we've got, we've got the RNs you know, uh, at the top, we've got the LPNs, and we've got the what we call cert certified nurse aides, CNAs, right? Which require, takes about uh, 150 hours or so. What the college has done is we've taken the CNA level and we've, rather than going upward to create better, more skills, we went downwards, okay? So we started at the very low, uh, lowest level, the companion aid level, 25 hours. But we create a very regimented class, okay? And 25 hours is two weeks, so people can you know keep their day job, go at night night school, and in the weekends and and, and then pick up the certificate. So the f first 25 hour course, you can get a companion aid position, and everybody that has taken the course and have sought employment have gotten jobs. Okay, that's not a problem. They'll, they'll, they they're picked up by private duties all the time. The second level is what we call a personal care assistant. That's another 25 hours. Then we've got a third level is called a home care assistant, another 35 hours. And then on top of that, we've got a home, a, an Alzheimer's course, which is 16 hours. So it's articulated. You can't take the third unless you take the first and second first, so, so to speak. So we, we, we're trying to look at ways in which we can create um, more workers as quickly as possible, but well-trained so that we can meet this demand that is growing very quickly. Because even if we have all the money from state or from other sources and all of, all of, all of the ideas that we have as far as services are concerned, we don't have workers, we're in trouble. Okay, so we got to think in terms of how are we going to, in a sense, create some of these kinds of workers. So one of the things is, uh, we've done is we've, we've created the, this articulated level of training for workers. We've also worked with um, um, uh, the care homes and the foster homes in terms of continued education because we are um, uh, somewhat f concerned about the fact that what's happening is that um, 
the care homes have been relicensed as rack homes and adult foster homes, and they have begin, uh, they've begun the process of taking on much more complex medical cases, uh, uh, clients, uh, much more unstable, and without that much as far as support. Okay, they, they've got maybe a, a nurse case manager that might come in from time to time that they can call, but for the most part, they're long ran lone rangers, right? They're, they're on their own. And um, there's not much as far as continuing education for them is concerned, very, very little. Um, and so we, we uh, work with the Hawaii Community Foundation and we created a whole bunch of uh, continuing education courses. And then uh, we provided that to the, the uh, resi small residential community and we said, uh, asked them if they liked it. They said, yes, we love it. I said, would you be willing to pay for it? They said, no, we won't. <laughs> so, so we're kind of in a, this, this, uh, this uh, crossroads here as far as what to do. In the meantime, because the grant is coming to an end, what we did was we worked with, the, uh, with uh, a, a uh, online learning management system to transfer as much as possible online. So that system is in place. We've got about 26 courses on, uh, up right now, and people can uh, watch about half an hour segments take the course, take an exam, and then uh, print a, a certificate of participation. So that's available uh, and, and great for, uh, for substitutes as well. Again, um, there's not that much uh, interest uh, by the care homes and the foster homes. And this is a concern because these are the, the kinds of continuing education that they're getting right now is basically um, um, they, they'll call maybe a, an association meeting They'll, they'll have somebody invited, maybe a professional from a pharmacy, for example, to come and talk for a little while. And that person, after having given a, maybe a 20 or half an hour speech, will pass out um, a certificate to everybody, including people that come late. And there is no testing whatsoever. So it's just a piece of paper. But that piece of paper will also indicate how many hours that, that presentation was. They'll take that piece of paper, put it in their folder so that next year when the inspector comes, they can show them that they have their 12 hours for the year. Okay, so that's what's happening. Okay, there's not much as far as strategically figuring out a way of improving their overall skill sets or the knowledge base given the fact that the, the, the population that they're beginning to serve is much more, much more disabled. We've got to begin to prepare this, you know, or work along, you know, and to, to, to address this particular issue. That's what we're trying to do right now. But we're, we're kind of stuck on this because um, they're, they're, they're not too uh, keen about paying for the cost of, long, uh, of uh, continuing education. The second thing that we're, we're working on right now is because uh, this, this tsunami is so huge, we, we recognize that we need to do, uh, uh, no matter what we do as far as training is concerned, we cannot train enough workers, no, not at the college anyway. Um, we, we, need, we need to do much more. And so the first backstop that we, we've been um, talking about is how can we take all of the knowledge that we have at the college, strip it down, make it simple, and give it to the families. And, and so, so that's what we're doing. The other thing, uh, we, we have a television show and we, we provide uh, on Kupuna Connections just basic information about elder care and we provide it uh, on Saturday mornings to everybody. And, and all of the segments are also on the website. People can watch. We've got about 40 or 50 um, segments that are available. Um, again, that's, that's something that we're doing as far as family caregiver. The, the third thing that we're, we, we're looking at right now and I'm working with the uh, Executive Office on Aging on right now, is we've got to recognize that we cannot keep, uh, we, we, we'll have to work with the other community colleges uh, statewide, of course, in, in building more paraprofessional training and family caregiver training. But um, we've, got to, we've got to pivot a bit and start looking at uh, the boomers. We've got to look at people that are still active and engaged and we've got to begin to have them think in terms of how can they remain as, um, as active and as, uh, as healthy uh, for as long as possible. This whole idea of active life expectancy. You know? So we've got to begin looking at what can we do to promote active aging. And so this is a whole, this is, a, this is not um, 
a supply side, it's more of a demand side. Because if we create more, more healthy people in the community, we'll perhaps put less pressure on our whole service sector. Um, uh, and, and so this is something that we want to work on. The last thing that we're working on is trying to coordinate with the other community colleges. They were not as fortunate as we were in terms of receiving monies from the legislature uh, in terms of, uh, uh, of providing the kind of uh, you know, programs that we, we were able to create. But we've got to be able to take our curriculum, bring it over to the other, uh, other community colleges, and see what we can do in terms of uh, encouraging and supporting their efforts at meeting their community needs as well as far as workforce is concerned. This is an ongoing and this is, a, is a, an issue that is going to be long term. Last one, um, I mentioned uh, active aging initiative. We've got to shift our focus um, from sick care to age as an asset. So age as sick care to age as an asset. Take for example, uh, how many of you have seen the, you know, the senior, uh, city and county of Honolulu's um, um, uh, you know, what do they call it, uh, the, the, uh, the, the handbook uh, of senior services, right? We all seen that, right? Uh, it was uh, published uh, every, every other year, okay? So this senior handbook uh, of uh, inform uh, senior, uh, senior information and assistance handbook has, uh, is a tremendously useful resource, but if you, you thumb through it, there's something like about 300 agencies nursing homes, adult daycare centers, meals on wheels, assisted transportation, these are all sick care, okay? What we've got to do, we've got to look at this active aging population, the, the boomers that are coming in. I mean, just two years ago, the first boomers hit 65 now, okay? And na nationwide, we're having 10,000 boomers retire and hit 65 every day for the next 19 years. This is a tremendous number of people. And I've had friends who are boomers that have retired and they said, Colin, you know what, I probably, um, I'm 62 and I'm gonna retire and I probably have 20 to 30 more years to live, but you know what, I don't know what to do with my life. If we have too many people that run rudderless like that, we're gonna have a huge long-term care for, I think. We have gotta give people purpose, right? If, so, what I'm trying to do with the state, the Executive Office on Aging is say, let's create an information and assistance handbook for the boomers. We don't have, a, now they obviously, we're not talking long-term care. We're talking about somebody that retires and they say, you know, I wanna do something, maybe um, I wanna volunteer and there's no handbook, okay? There's no guide, there's, there's no, you know, uh, uh, career mentor uh, process that we have in, in town. So, so they may call a couple of numbers and maybe turned off with that and they say, you know what, forget it. I'm not going to do this. And we've lost this resource. We've got thousands of people that are engineers and teachers and nurses and, 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 and electricians and plumbers. And if we can marshal that resource for the greater good, you know, it's going to be better for them as individuals, you know, in terms of, just in terms of spiritual wellness, right? Existential, there's, there's meaning then, in a sense. So how do, we, how, do we, how do we make that pivot, you know, from just focusing on sick care, which we have to continue to do, but so also look at age as an asset, okay? Um, how do we create age-friendly communities, build infrastructures to promote independence, engagement, and intergenerational support? Um, and I was talking about this a active aging inventory, and that, that's a piece that um, we're working on right now. But there's not much that has been on the radar right now, and we've got to look at this. Okay, so right now there is no way before us, but there is a path after you walk. So this is a poet. Uh, the idea is that we've just got to, we've got to just try. We're going to make mistakes along the way. We pivot, we try again, you know, but we cannot simply say, this is too overwhelming. Let's not even try. Okay. If it's not us, then there's nobody else. We are, I mean, it, we, in a, in a sense, that this is, this is our watch. This is our watch, right? Okay. That's it. Thank you.